Hi, I'm Susan Taylor at Scripps Health in San Diego, California. You get those three dreaded words, you have cancer. Now what? Well, first we tell our patients to take a deep breath. Let's look at the biopsy report. Let's get some imaging studies done and meet with your medical team to talk about the course of treatment. So the course of treatment for many types of cancer includes radiation therapy. And radiation therapy has changed dramatically over the last 15, 20 years. Here to talk about advancements in radiation therapy are Dr. Ray Lin, who is the medical director of Scripps Radiation Oncology, and Dr. Prabhakar Tripuranini, who is division head of Scripps Radiation Oncology. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. All right, so let's start with the basics for folks who are just beginning this journey. What is radiation therapy? Radiation therapy is using various forms of radiation therapy uh, safely and effectively to manage cancer, cure cancer, and also used in some other types of diseases. So explain what radiation therapy is though, Dr. Radiation Ryan. therapy is one of the main modalities for cancer care. There are three main modalities. One is surgery, one is systemic treatment, such as chemotherapy, hormone therapy, immunotherapy, and one is radiation therapy. And radiation therapy involves using radiation beams to treat the cancer. Rather than take it out physically by surgery, we kind of radiate that cancer and, um, and, and You're do zapping it. it. Zapping it, yeah. yeah. There are two major forms of radiation therapy, giving radiation therapy from outside, external beam radiation therapy, that's what most of the patients get, the linear accelerators, et cetera. And there is also brachytherapy, that is the internal radiation therapy where we can put in radiation seeds or catheters and deliver radiation therapy from inside out. So how does, so the radiation therapy, the treatment has evolved greatly over the last 15 or 20 years. Tell, tell me how it's evolved, how it's changed. Radiation therapy has been around since 1895. Radiation therapy has been around more than 100 years. Wow. And around 1950s, uh, there was invention of a new machine called the Linear Accelerator. Uh, in linear Palo Alto, Accelerator? Linear Accelerator uh -huh. in Palo Alto, California. That really opened up the Pandora's box for the radiation therapy. I've been doing radiation therapy for the past 35 years. Three major things happened uh, in the past 35 years that really put the radiation therapy in the forefront of in the cancer management. The basic radiation producing apparatus, linear accelerator has been about the same. The first major advance is incorporation of the computers. These days machines are really fast, highly tailor made to deliver the radiation therapy precisely where we want to treat and how we want to treat. The second major advance is incorporating imaging equipment. Our linear accelerators these days come with X-ray machines built into that to take regular X-rays, CAT scans and MRIs that gave us the ability to look at the tumor just before and during the treatment so that we can safely and effectively and precisely deliver the treatment. The third thing that we already mentioned is we use chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and immunotherapy together that becomes much more effective. Often if the effectiveness of radiation therapy is let's say 10 points, chemotherapy by itself is only five points, by using chemo radiation therapy together, we can get up to 20 points. So we almost all cancers these days that we treat them for cure, we use a combination of radiation therapy along with some form of chemotherapy or hormone therapy or immunotherapy. Yeah, I say look at the computer age. Look at how, and think of your iPhone. You know, it took a long time from a basic phone, uh, your dial-up phone at home, to go to a cell phone, then from the cell phone to go from 2D, 3D, 4D, 5D. I mean, it's rapidly progressing. And I think because of the computer age with better imaging and better technology, radiation therapy has advanced, just like your cell phone, from, from 2D to 3D to 4D, that quickly. But it took a long time to get to 2D. So, so the radiation therapy of 15, 20, 30 years ago um, it was in a much broader range, you're saying? So let's say the tumor is here, you had to radiate an area that was bigger, and now you can be a lot more precise with the area that you hit? Well, definitely it was more coarse. These days, the radiation beams are much more precise, um, but also because we, we see the target much more precisely, not just because the, the machines could create a much more precise target, it's because we can see the target much more precisely. Because we have better imaging with MRIs and PET scans, we can see on the computer where that tumor is and arrange beams with various angles to treat that target while sparing normal tissue. Are, are you doing it in real time that you can see it as it's actually, as the beam is actually hitting the tumor or do you have to immobilize the person, the, the patient on the table and then model it and, and 
you know, calculate, yeah, this is where it's going to hit. Even if you immobilize the patient and put the marks on the skin, still things inside the body are going to move, such as the heart, the lung, the prostate, and bowel, and all those things. Uh, on our machines, and most of the machines, these high-end linear accelerators, uh, we can take an X-ray or a CAT scan just before the treatment and see exactly where it is and modify what you're going to treat to shift the beams right on the fly. And while you're treating, you can also take X-rays and modify what you're doing. So that's the next major advance in radiation therapy, the real-time image guidance. Yeah, at Scripps uh -huh. Health, we have machines where we can actually treat in sub-millimeter precision because the machines are so precise these days. So you're talking about sub millimeters, <laughs> fraction of a millimeter, a fraction mm -hmm. of a millimeter, mm -hmm. which is which is great because you want to protect the nearby surrounding healthy tissue exactly and the right. vital organs, right? That's exactly right. So is radiation therapy better on certain cancers uh, than other types of cancers? There are certain cancers that are more what what we call radio responsive, more radio responsive to radiation therapy, such as lymphomas, and then there are other cancers that are more what we call radio resistant, like sarcomas, but all cancers can be treated with radiation therapy. You just have to kind of manipulate in the amount of dose you give per day and how often to give it to, um, you know, based on the sensitivities of the tumor. For instance, if a tumor is more sensitive, you can give less dose per day. But if a tumor is more, a but if a tumor is less sensitive to radiation, you just have to give a higher dose per day. So all cancers are sensitive to radiation, but some are more biologically um, sensitive, and more some are more biologically resistant. So, so the biologically sensitive ones would be lymphoma, lymphoma, lymphoma seminoma, etc. Mm -hmm. Seminoma is testicular cancer. Okay, yeah. and then the ones that are not so sensitive where you'd have to give a higher dose? I would, would say be... melanoma and sarcomas tend to be less sensitive, and then everything, in, and then the other tumors are kind of in between. Right, so, what, so, so common, treat, common we, would be breast we, cancer. What we, about breast cancer? We treat just about every single cancer with definitive radiation therapy, starting from brain tumors, throat cancers, lung cancers, breast cancers, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer. And so actually just about, just about every single cancer is treated with radiation therapy. As Ray was saying a few minutes ago, we diagnose about 1.6 million cancers in the United States every year. More than 1 million patients actually get radiation therapy as the sole treatment or part of the cancer management. So that's a large number of patients. 1 million patients actually get cancer radiation therapy. And about a third to half of them are cured solely because of radiation therapy. It's a very safe and effective form and a highly curative form. So are there certain types of cancer where you wouldn't need chemotherapy? Uh uh, and you could just do the radiation? Absolutely. And those would be, for so example? Like prostate cancer, some of the very early lung cancers these days, the data is showing that you can give four to five radiation zaps, you can say, you know, four to five treatments with what's called radio surgery, which is just as, just as equivalent in cure as taking the lobe out surgically. So radiation therapy has come a long way where we have technology where we can pinpoint on very small tumors, even very large tumors, and give an equivalent cure to surgery many times. So when, when you, we talk about cancer care, sometimes radiation is given, sometimes chemotherapy is given, sometimes surgery is given, and sometimes there's a combination of two or three of these things. Are there certain people who can, should have radiation, and are there people who can, should not have, should not have radiation? Well, I would say it depends on the type of tumor, I would say it depends on the location. Is it easier to take out or is it easier to radiate? And for certain cancers, such as breast cancer, if a woman has lupus or some kind of autoimmune disorders, sometimes that will tip us towards giving surgery rather than radiation therapy. Because? Uh, because of the skin reaction, the skin response to radiation therapy. And then there are certain patients who we would tip towards radiation because surgery would be harder on them. The number of patients that actually cannot have radiation therapy because of low pulse is far and few in between. Maybe one out of 1,000 patients or one out of 5,000 patients. Yeah. And I think if the cancer is localized, most of the body sites, they can be a candidate for definitive radiation therapy. And the advantage of radiation therapy is you don't need to go through a major surgery and you get to keep what you have. For example, as simple as a skin cancer on the tip of the nose, uh, most surgeons can do a wonderful job, but your nose gets messed up. You can have four weeks of radiation therapy and get to keep the nose exactly the way you have right in there. <laughs> um, so let's say I've been diagnosed with cancer and I come and I'm told that I need radiation therapy. Um, what is the procedure? What happens when a, when a patient comes to see you for the first time? I think the most important thing is actually to have a treatment plan 
that's where the radiation oncologist, surgical oncologist, and medical oncologist work together and devise a plan. Sometimes, actually, radiation therapy is the only treatment that patient is going to get. Very often these days, actually, it's a combination of multiple treatments. Do you want to take on from there? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, after the plan is created, patients undergo immobilization and simulation where we do a mapping of the, of the, you know, of the target, where we immobilize the patient so that they're treated in the same position each day. Then a planning is done in the computer in the background by physicists and dosimetrists and, and radiation oncologists. After we plan the treatment, what, we're, what we do with planning the treatment is we want to minimize doses to normal structures and deliver all the doses to the tumor. After we plan the treatment, the patient's scheduled for treatments. And radiation takes about five to 10 minutes sometimes. Uh, it's Monday through Friday treatment, uh, anywhere between one day to up to six to seven weeks, typically. So what when you do the simulation, uh, I tell patients actually, we do a CAT scan of where we want to treat. We reconstruct the CAT scan. I have a virtual view on the computer. I can slice and dice any way I want. And as Ray said a few minutes earlier, we can bring in the PET scans and MRIs and actually fuse and see exactly where the tumor is and we decide what we want to treat, what we don't want to treat. And then uh, I have a whole group of people that actually work within our department, a medical radiation physicist, dosimetrist, therapist. What's, we all what's, work... it, dos, 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 what is it called? Dos a dosimetrist, dosimetrist is dosimetrist? someone who is trained in planning and designing radiation fields and creating doses for, for a radiation plan. And a physicist is usually someone who supervises a dosimetrist to do this, a medical physicist. So if, so if I have a, a tumor on my lung, mm -hmm. then this team's they map out exactly where the tumor is, where the radiation is going to hit the tumor, what, what angle. angle it's going to come in at. We create customized blocks because each angle where the beam comes in, you know, the beam's going to see the tumor from each angle differently. So, you know, from ang for instance, let's say you have prostate cancer. If a beam's coming through the front, it's going to hit the bladder. So you could customize the beam where it treats less of the bladder from that angle. So that you don't have side effects like exactly. urinary incontinence. From the side, you may want to customize that beam so that it avoids the rectum. So from every angle, the beam could be created uh, in a special way and molded in a special way to give... That's the technological advance. Yeah. These machines actually, the true beam STX that we have is actually such a highly sophisticated linear accelerator. Once we design the plan right in there, all the information is sent to the linear accelerator. And as the machine is moving around, it's constantly changing the shape of the beam and how much the intensity is delivering. On the top of that, actually, we can do imaging before, we can do imaging during, so that we can precisely and accurately deliver the radiation therapy in a highly defined fashion. So this, this true beam STX technology, and we've got some animation to, sh to show the folks about this, it's the actual, you're, you're, the patient is lying there on the table, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're not moving. The actual machine is moving around the patient. And is the beam, is it 360 degrees? Can you come in at any it, angle? It could be 360 degrees. I think of it as, think of a beam that's rotating around your body. The beam goes through a checkerboard. That checkerboard opens and closes from each angle where the beam's going through. Because what you want to do is you want to mold that checkerboard to conform to the tumor. You can also deliver a different dose through each grid of the checkerboard so that um, the areas near the center of the tumor, you can give a higher dose. The area at the peripheral of the tumor near a normal structure, you can give a lower dose through that grid. So I think of it as a beam going around the body, but the beam goes through a grid, which is like a checkerboard that opens and closes. It's a highly sophisticated linear accelerator. It's a, a very high-end computing right there. Think of like a choreography between the imaging, delivering the beam, constantly changing where you are delivering and how you are delivering and how much you are delivering, and also motion management, all of them put together. That's what the machine is doing seamlessly. And amazing, it can deliver the treatment in about a minute or two probably one of the fastest machines that you can actually buy on the marketplace today. It was today. so wild. So before, I remember my mom had breast cancer back in 1999, and she had six weeks of radiation treatment, five days a week for six weeks. Um, and she had to lay there for a long mm -hmm. time. Now, you're saying with this TrueBeam STX technology, talk about the, the amount of times per week and how many weeks and how much they have to lay on the table. I mean, it's a lot less in all of those categories, well, isn't it? Well, yeah, so it's a lot less time on the table for almost all the radiation therapy equipment these days. Um, but it's also a lot fewer weeks because these days we know that for certain cancers, 
for like, let's say breast cancer, we used to treat to six to seven weeks. These days we know that the, a, lot, a good majority of the women can probably do it in three to four weeks uh, because there's data that shows that three to four weeks of radiation therapy by giving a slightly higher dose each day is probably equivalent um, to six or seven weeks of radiation therapy. And the reason why we can give slightly higher doses of radiation each day is because the technology is better. It's we're more sophisticated in delivering the equipment. Uh, it's treatments. so much more precise. It's so much more precise that you could give a higher dose in fewer treatments. For example, for prostate cancer, uh, typically uh, we used to give about 40 treatments, eight weeks. If you think mm -hmm. six weeks is bad, that's eight weeks of treatment mm -hmm. right in there. With the Walter machines, you have to be on the table for a good probably 20 minutes to 25 minutes right in there. Almost half to two thirds of patients actually get only five treatments, just one week of radiation therapy. They're on the table no more than 15 minutes in and out so quickly right in there. So I think with the advent of this uh, true beam STX and the light linear accelerates right in there, we are much more precise. We can safely and constantly and accurately give a very high to the prostate and not give any damage to the rectum or the bladder surrounding. So in, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to talk about some news. I want you to hold this thought for a second. We're going to talk about there are some recent news stories about women getting radiation on their left breast and then ending up with heart disease several, several years later. Um, we're going to talk about how radiation therapy actually affects, that, affects the heart. So hold that thought. We'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Um, typically, the, the radiation treatments last what? I mean, is, it, is, there, is there a norm? Is it two to three weeks, or is it one week or 10 days, or it really depends on where the depends tumor is? On the tu what, how, does it, how do you determine so how long? So it depends on whether it's a curative treatment or what's called a palliative treatment to take away pain or discomfort. Curative treatments tend to be a little bit longer. Also, it depends on are we giving chemotherapy with it? Because if we're giving chemotherapy with it, it's usually a longer treatment because we don't want to give a higher dose. So it can last anywhere between, like I said, one or two days to about six to seven weeks. But the time on the table these days is really short, maybe five to 10 minutes each day. So talk about 3D and 4D tumor imaging. I know in the past, you know, 2D is, is one dimensional, 3D is you see the, the whole thing, but 4D deals with motion, 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 motion. Management. right. So how does that work? That's Give me where, an example of that. That's where the True STX really come in handy right in there. So while we're, take a prostate cancer as an example, you put the patient on the table, and then you do your X-ray images, or you do a CAT scan. You see that the prostate actually has moved uh, either up or down or front or back right there. You can make all the adjustments. And right on the table where the patient is lying down on the table, right? And you take one more set of X-rays to make sure that you want to be exactly where it is right in there. And then you start treating. In certain cases, actually, you can image during the treatment and make the appropriate adjustments actually while you are treating. And Ray is working on the uh, management of the breast cancer as the patients are breathing. Exactly. Because what you want to do is when you're breathing and you have breast cancer and your chest is going up and down, what you can do is you can learn how to control the beam to have it on and off based on the patient's breathing cycle. Um, also, I, I think of 4D CT as, uh, I think, lung and liver cancer. With your lung and your liver, when you breathe, the tumor moves up and down like this. Now, in the old days, what we would do is, as the tumor moves up and down, you have to have a large target to get it. But what we can do is so because- So you hit it no matter where the yes, tumor is as you're breathing right. in and out. With 4D CT scan that we have at Scripps Health, what happens is, as the tumor goes up and down, we can see that the tumor moves different directions, up and, you know, up and down, right and left, front and back. They move a different distance. So what you can do is you can generate a bigger margin where the distance is greater of movement, a smaller margin where the distance is less. So what we're trying to do is basically have tighter margins, have more accurate treatments, have high precision. So, so let's say you have a, a tumor on the lung and as you're breathing, it moves in and out of frame. When it moves out of frame, what you're saying is the machine actually turns on and off as it's moving in and that out of frame? Is, that is what the future technology is and that's what we are currently working on. Okay, but that's not available currently right now with, with the TrueBeam STX? We have, we, have ver we, have different, we have versions of it okay. where we could, um, it's called you know, respiratory gating or, or you know, with, with breast cancer, what we're working on is as you breathe up at, as you breathe in and out, as the field, as the breast and the uh, target moves in and out of the, uh, the radiation field, we can turn the beam on and off based on uh, the respiration. And so that's really much more targeted therapy just to the area. And so, how much less radiation do you get 
um, the with dose this of kind radiation of therapy is the same, but the volume that you're treating, it all depends upon how much the tumor is moving. If the tumor is moving, uh, let's say, an inch up and down right in there, in those patients, actually, you significantly save a portion of the lung, that 5% of the lung or 10% of the lung. If the tumor is not moving much or moving only a few millimeters, uh, then it really doesn't make a difference. So there's not, is, is, there's not any way to say, you know, on average, you're getting what? 10% less radiation or 25% less radiation, but because it, it's targeted right there because of that 4D movement? It depends on the volume. It does. So so the bigger the volume, the, the, more, the more important it is to, ha to have a smaller target. You mm -hmm. know, when you have a small target already, you know, it's probably not going to matter as much as a bigger target because a bigger target or where, where the target is. You know, if it's on the bottom of the lung where there's a lot of breathing, a lot of movement near the diaphragm, um, the 4D uh, gating is going to be more important than a tumor at the top of the lung. All right, so let's, we talked about this a couple of minutes ago. Let's come back to this. There have been news stories about women um, getting radiation on the left breast and then getting heart disease um, several years later. So please address those concerns and, and what is involved in all that. Yes, there was some literature recently that looked back on women who had breast cancer treatments years and years ago. And they found out that women who had left-sided breast cancer treatments were more likely to get heart disease in the future because what happens is the radiation beams could hit some of the vessels around the heart. And these vessels can develop heart they, they can develop plaque. It's like hardening of the artery. That can lead to an increased risk of heart disease. But thankfully, Susan, these days, the radiation therapy is, is no longer your mother's radiation therapy. The equipment has gone, um, has, has become so much better, so much per precise. There's so many ways to treat breast cancers now with, for the left side. For instance, what you can do is, instead of lying on your back where the beam goes across, you can lie on your stomach where the breast hangs down and treat from the bottom to avoid the heart. We also talked about respiratory motion, respiratory gating. Also, we talked about beams that have that, remember that checkerboard that can open and close. So if there's a grid that's um, where the beam's going in that's close to the heart, you can simply block it. So there's many ways to manipulate this. As a matter of fact, last- So say, go back again. There's oh. actually ways that you can block the beam from a certain- Right. Remember, it's like a body. checker. So the beam goes through a checkerboard. Mm -hmm. If part of the um, target is near the heart, you simply block that part of that grid that's near the heart so that there's no beam that's going through the heart. Also, like with, with respiratory motion, you can manipulate the beam as patients breathe in and out, as the heart moves in and out towards the chest. But also, like I said, motion, uh, the way you immobilize the patient, the way you um, position the patient, whether on her back or on her um, stomach, you can manipulate um, doses to the heart. So I'm, I'm really happy to say that these days with modern radiation therapy, heart risk is fairly low. As a matter of fact, last year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, there was a publication that stated that with modern radiation therapy, the incidence of radiation therapy leading to heart-related deaths is only 0.3%. If you're a non-smoker. Now, if you're a smoker, it's about 1%. So if you have a low risk to begin with already, radiation therapy doesn't really add much more risks. So when you look down the road, what do you see? Well, I'm really excited about more targeted therapy, more immunotherapy. You know, uh, so not just uh, advancements in radiation therapy, like Dr. Tripponini said, with MRI-based linear accelerators. So in our field, I'm excited about the MRI-based, but just in other fields, targeted therapy, immunotherapy. And that's better immunotherapy surgery. is using the body's immune system to attack exactly. the cancer. Because right. we know that, for instance, I recently treated a patient who had widespread melanoma throughout the body. But we know that by giving radiation therapy to one of the melanoma tar tumors, and then by injecting immunotherapy into her, all of the tumors disappeared. Because what happens is the radiation therapy causes some kind of inflammatory response or immune reaction, where when you give the immunotherapy, it potentiates, it makes the immunotherapy work even better. So the immunotherapy and the radiation, even though we meant to attack one tumor, ended up attacking all the tumors in this patient's body. So the advancements in treatment have come a long way. As a matter of fact, according to the American Cancer Society, since 1991, the incidence of cancer-related deaths have dropped 26%. For prostate cancer, a, a less than 50%, a, a greater than 50% um, um, decrease in deaths related to prostate cancer, greater than 50% uh, 
um, decrease in deaths related to rectal cancer. Breast cancer um, deaths have decreased by 1% a year since 1995. These are really exciting statistics. That's hopeful. Um, just go back and get some perspective. Were there, were there any side effects to radiation, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago compared to any side effects to it today or looking down the road? Come much less side effects these days because the tar because you're more targeted. You know, there are much more side effects. Before you had many more skin burns, many more um, for prostate cancer, much more diarrhea, much more um, loose bowel movements and burning with urination. These days for prostate cancer, we hardly see any side effects with radiation therapy. So much more side of, less simply, side effects. Simply, we treat a much smaller radius to treat because we know exactly where to treat and we can track it, we can image it. So instead of, just to give an example for prostate cancer, uh, in the beginning of my career, just to treat prostate cancer, I used to treat about a liter of the body. 1,000 cc. These days I treat prostate cancers maybe no more than 85, 100 cc, one-tenth of the volume. And we give much higher doses. So all the surrounding structures, rectum, bladder, hardly get any dose, are a very small dose of radiation therapy. So side effects are much lesser, effectiveness is much higher, patients do it much better. And Susan, I have to say that one of the really important things in um, cancer care in the future is looking at who doesn't need treatments as well. Because we know that not all cancers are the same. Some people will never die of their cancers. So not all, prostate, not all patients with prostate cancers need treatment. These days what we can do is for certain cases of breast cancer, we can look at the, on a molecular level of patient's breast cancer, whether she would benefit from chemotherapy, whether she would benefit from long-term hormone blocker, whether she would even benefit from radiation therapy. Because if you look at the um, molecularly, these, these cells, we can have an idea of who's going to benefit from treatments and who, don't, who doesn't really need treatments because the cancer's not really that, it's you know, something that, that you will live with as opposed to something you will that's, die from. That's exactly right. So I think that not, not only do we have better cures, we really have to think of who doesn't need treatment because we want better cures, but we also want good quality of life for our patients. What's, what's the most rewarding part of your job? Seeing the patient, holding their hands, offering the best treatment and take them through treatment. And when they come back to see me year after year, 32 years, 34 years, that's the most rewarding part and see their family, the kids, grandkids. Sometimes actually they bring lunch just to introduce, this is my doctor. Aww. That's the most rewarding <laughs> part of being a doctor. You know, I recently had a patient that we sent to hospice six years ago. I gave her palliative radiation therapy. I just thought, well, she's older, she's frail. Let's just do some, a little bit of radiation, a little bit of palliation. She showed up at my door for follow-up a few weeks ago, it really shocked me. I said, where have you been all these years? <laughs> she said, I traveled the world Aww. because you saved my life. Nothing better than that. Dr. Lynn, Dr. Tripper and Nini, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. At Scripps, we have uh, hundreds of doctors who provide cancer care. If you would like more information about radiation therapy at Scripps Health, just click on the link or go to scripps.org forward slash videos. If you want more critical information about your health, please subscribe to our uh, Scripps Health YouTube channel and also follow us on social media at Scripps Health. I'm Susan Taylor. Thanks so much for joining us. It's our mission at Scripps to help you heal, enhance, even save your life.